I'm sorry I cannot be here be there in person, but I'm happy to be able to join virtually. And let me share my slides so we can get started. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hello everyone. Um, today we're going to talk about software preservation, in particular in the context of the Software Heritage Project. But let me start with a more general notion, which I believe is dear to many people active in free software and in general, uh, people that care about the sustainability of various kinds of ecosystem. And that is the notion of commons. So commons, which in Italian we call beni comuni, are all those resources which are accessible to all members of the society and that encompasses various kinds of, of goods that are held in common and not owned privately. So this is very well known in the context of uh, ecology movement, for example, as for resources such, hair, such as air, water, and habitable earth. But it's also, it's also relevant in the context of uh, digital goods. In particular, there is this notion of the software commons, which is defined as essentially all computer software, which is available at little or no cost, and which can be altered and reused with very few restrictions. And of course, at this conference, we are all into free and open source software. So the resemblance between this definition and free and open source software should be striking for most of the people here. And the first point I want you to think about is that essentially every time you or someone that contributes to free and open source software releases a line of code, which is released under a free and open source license, essentially that line of code becomes part of a greater, of a greater body of things of digital goods, which is the software commons. So essentially we are all together creating and maintaining this body of knowledge, this body of, uh, of digital knowledge, which is the software commons. And if you agree with that, there is a legitimate question of whether aside from actually contributing to it with our own lines of code, we are taking good care of this uh, body of digital good. Essentially, are we making sure that there is a sustainable future for the preservation of all this software that we are, in a way, producing together? And in fact, there are reasons for concerns because like any kind of digital information, software, in particular free software, is fragile in the sense that it can disappear. It can be distributed today from a place that tomorrow might no longer be there. For instance, there's been situation in which large forges and that were operated by for-profit companies are no longer available today for entirely legitimate business reasons. For instance, Gitorius, that some of you might have used, no longer exists today. Google Code, that for a while Google operated as a, a forge for collaborative software development, no longer exists either. Bitbucket, that still exists, no longer hosts some kind of repositories such as Mercurial repositories. So essentially all the places that we use today to produce and collaborate around software are here with us today, but are not necessarily going to be with us in the future if you consider a long enough period. So essentially, Imagine uh, trying to find the history of a website. And if you, most of you probably know that you can use the Internet Archive to retrieve old versions of a web page and see how it was uh, years ago. But if a repository on GitHub disappear, or if GitHub as a whole, 50 years from now, disappear forever, where do you go to retrieve the source code that today is hosted there? And sure, you if you have used Git, you know that Git is a distributed version control system. So you might say that someone should have a copy of that repository somewhere, but that will not necessarily help you when you need to find it if you don't know who has a copy of that repository. So this is the reason why a few years back, the idea dates to 2015 and we announced it publicly in 2016, we launched the initiative called Software Heritage. And the idea of Software Heritage in a nutshell is to collect, preserve and share with everybody who needs it, uh, the entire body of software which is available in source code form. And we do this for, to cover four different use cases. So the first use case is actually to be a reference catalog. So essentially uh, archiving a place so that people can find and reference all software source code. So essentially it's a place where you need, for, for instance, the, the part number of something that has been released as source code, you can go see if it exists and uh, have an identifier for that piece of software. It's also meant to be an archive for archival sake. So essentially, uh, if we agree that we are creating together an important body of knowledge that is stored in software source code, it is important to avoid that that knowledge is lost. So the idea here is to create a long-term place where 
if something is lost, disappears from its current hosting location, you can go to retrieve it in the future, uh, no matter how far in the future. And finally, given I'm by, uh, by main profession uh, a researcher, I'm kind of envious of what our colleagues in, in physics can do in building amazing research infrastructure that are shared and used by researchers around the world when they need it. And essentially, the, the key idea on this point here is to build a research infrastructure where researchers who want to run experiments on source code itself can actually do that without having to recrawl the software themselves. So there is a, a body of, of research, which is in, which is empirical software engineering, in which researchers often want to do analysis on vast body of source code. They cannot do that, so they do that on small samples. And here the idea is that you have a place where all the software source code that has ever been published is. So you can run your experiments in a reproducible way on the entire body of this software, and then go home and uh, analyze your data, so while others can uh, do similar analysis by themselves. So this is the, the general view of uh, why we're running software heritage and the kind of use cases we want to support. We're also doing this in a kind of a principled way. So here you are, essentially, we want to be a piece of infrastructure that is helpful for the use case which I mentioned, but we're doing it following some key principles. So in terms of technology, the technology that we are building ourselves to actually create and maintain the archive is itself entirely free and open source software. And the project is run as a classic open source software project. So you can come, you can see our code, you can propose patches, they are reviewed and they can be accepted and become part of the infrastructure uh, themselves. Uh, we're also building it in a way that is fully replicated because we know well that the only way to make sure that something will you know, live on forever is to make sure you have enough copies of it. So we operate multiple copies of the archives ourselves, and we are also building a network of mirrors operated by other actors around the world so that each one of them has a full copy of the archive as we have it. Uh, in terms of the content we archive, we are principal on the fact that all the pieces of code we archive are identified by intrinsic identifiers. I'm going to talk a little bit more about those uh, in a bit. And we also make sure to not have, you know, uh, not store opinions about uh, artifacts we store, but only store facts about them. So everything we store in the archive as, a, as an information about where it comes from. And instead of storing information like uh, this software is uh, opinion like this software appears to be under the gpl we store facts like the license file in the, at the top level director of the software says it is under the gpl or we have run this tool and we and this tool run with this configuration and, and this version says that this software is under the gpl uh, in terms of organizational infrastructure, we are a non-profit initiative and we, uh, we are multi-stakeholders. So we have uh, funding from public bodies, we have funding from sponsors, we have funding from donors. And uh, we believe this is the best way to essentially minimize the influence that any single actor can have on a mission that we believe is for uh, the good of humanity. Uh, in terms of what we actually archive, in case you want to know, in case you're curious about more details, essentially we replicate the data model that you find today in most uh, modern version control system. So we essentially, we crawl places like a Git repository or a subversion repository or packages from source code distribution. And we store all the versions of all the source code files we find there. So not only the version that happens to be as the most recent commit in a given repository, but really we crawl the history of each repository we, we encounter and store all the version of all files in there since the very first version. We also store all the revision metadata. So for instance, who is the author of a commit? What was the commit message? When was the commit done in terms of timestamps? If there are cryptographic signatures of releases, we store all of those and also all crawling information. So essentially where and when we have archived any single uh, element of source code among the above that we have stored in our archive. We do that in a, a data model which is canonical and independent from any specific VCS technology. So we just, it's not like we only run some Git clones, but we really, we crawl Git repository and store them in a common model. And we do the same for Subversion, for Mercurial, so that if 50 years from now, everyone migrates to a different technology. Our data model will be the same, and we will not have to you know, recall everything just because the world moved to uh, a newfangled um, version control system. We currently do not archive other parts of 
classic open source projects like websites, wikis, issues, or mailing lists, because there are other initiatives that are taking care of archiving those stuff. So essentially, our plan is we focus on uh, source code and its development history. We make it easy out to reference uh, what we have archived so that other places like uh, uh, some sort of semantic Wikipedia of software can reconstruct the history of individual open source projects saying the source code is archived at Software Heritage, the mailing list are archived the at Gmail, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of data flow, we are essentially a big crawler. So we do not crawl the entire web, uh, but essentially we have some a curated list of places that we know distribute source code software. So software in source code form, sorry. So these are all the forges that you can mention, GitHub, various instances of GitLab, Bitbucket. Uh, you can have your own instances of self-hosted forges added there. We crawl distributions that also distribute source code, like these Debian source packages, or uh, package manager repositories like NPM, or PyPy, or CPAN. So we have all these places. We develop, as time goes by, essentially uh, components that are able to visit those places and list all the packages or all the repositories that are stored there. And for each one of them, we create a data point, which is a software origin. So essentially a URL that identifies a place where source code is distributed from. And then periodically we visit all those places, all those software origins with a dedicated loader component, like a Git loader or a Mercurial loader or a loader for a Debian source package. And every time we call that software origin, we see what is the new software that is in there and we store it in the archive. The archive has a peculiar data model itself in which it is a giant graph which is called a Merkle DAG. Uh, it's a structure that you might be familiar with if you have looked into uh, ledger technology or if you looked into the internals of modern distributed version control system like Git itself. And essentially, it is a structure that has some interesting properties in the sense that it duplicates everything. So essentially, in this structure, if you see one, the first time you see one file, you store it in your graph as a new leaf. But in the future, if you encounter the same file in a gazillion other different places, you just do not store it again. You just add a link to the file that you stored the first time. And this, is, this goes essentially all the way up. So the same entire directory of source code files is stored only once. The same commit, which we call a revision in our data model, is also stored only once. So if you have one million repositories that all have the same commit, maybe because there are forks of the same project at a given point in its history, that commit is also stored on, on only once. This is the same for releases, for software releases, and also for the entire state of a version control system repository, which we store in objects called snapshots. So a snapshot is like a picture that we take of, of a Git repository or of any kind of software repositories. And if that repository is forked thousands of times on GitHub or even on different platforms like GitLab or any other forge out there, essentially we store the full state of the repository only once, avoiding wasting resources in storing it over and over again. And in addition to this structure, this Merkle structure, we have what we call software origins, which are just URLs pointing uh, to the state of the repository that was found at that URL at the time of the last visit. So in a sense, what is interesting about this data structure is on one side, the fact that we, do, we deduplicate everything, making it feasible to essentially do the, the, the archival work that we do, but also that we are materializing a unified view on the entire software commons. So we can see where software that you have developed yourself and published on your personal Git repository. Maybe later on, it's been used as a basis for doing something else in our research work or in some enterprise open source software. And we can see who has used your software if they base their work, the public work on it and see that they've created a new version of it, for instance. Uh, this is just not theory, it's something that exists for real. So um, you can go to archive.softwareheritage.org and you will see there what are our current data sources. You will find that we crawl the most famous uh, uh, forges, we crawl many distributions, we crawl many, we crawl many package managers. We have there the archives of software uh, repositories that no longer exist, software forges that no longer exist. For instance, we have a full copy of Google Code or Gitorius, or we have recently uh, started archiving SourceForge and also we have retrieved all the Mercurial repository from Bitbucket when they stopped supporting it. And all these are sources that you will find indexed at archive.softwareheritage.org. It is a 
pretty big archive. So we have more than 11 billion unique source of code files archived, more than 2 billion unique commits archived, coming from more than 160 million projects. On disk, it's an archive of about one petabyte. So it is big, but it's not, you know, big as on a video, a video archive, for instance, but it's still substantial, not something you can easily host on your laptop. And if you're curious, if you're into graphs, it's also a pretty big graph. So it's 20 billion nodes and 20 billion edges. It's not as big as the graph of the web, but it's still uh, a substantial graph. It is the largest public source archive in the world, and of course, it's growing uh, daily as, as long as crawling goes on. So uh, let me just show a few examples of how you can use it. So I'm going to share a different uh, window here for a moment, just a sec. I'm going to share my browser window. And OK, so this is something that you can do yourself. Uh, so you can visit archive.softwareheritage.org today. And uh, you will have a classic search box that, by default, searches on the URL of Software Origins. So uh, this is a bit uh, naive, but it's often used. It works pretty well in most cases because usually in the URL you have the organization name and you have the project name. So, for instance, you can search uh, HTTPD, uh, Apache HTTPD, for instance, and you will end up on the. Uh, what did I say? This is my network connection, I think. Yes. Uh, so Apache HTTPD, you will see here all the list of results. You will see that here the first hit is github.com Apache HTTPD. And if we click on it, you will essentially, what you will find is that essentially the equivalent of a repository browsing interface, but you're not browsing the live version of the archive. You're, you're browsing a version of the Apache HTTPD archive, archive on, on November 3rd, so a couple of, uh, 10 days ago. And if we go here on visits, you will see all the different uh, archival runs we have done of the uh, repository starting from 2015 when we started archiving up to up on today. Uh, so you can browse the, the into the directory as usual. So I don't I'm not familiar with the uh, source code of Apache myself. So uh, but you, at some point you can, uh, for instance, let's get go through the models. There's a caching model here, and at some point we will find some definition of code that comes directly from uh, the, Apache, the Apache HTTPD source code base. Uh, you can do interesting stuff like you can uh, reference individual files using our persistent identifier. So if you click here on permalinks, you will find essentially a link that you can copy. And this is an, um, an identifier that we always refer to this specific version of the file modcache.c. And you can share it with others. And that will allow anyone to retrieve this precise version of these source code files forever within the Software Heritage Archive. You can also do other stuff. So for instance, if you go back to the, uh, to the top bar, you have here a Save Again button. So for instance, here, this can be used to tell to our crawlers, uh, can you please prioritize archiving again this repository so that the next crawl, it's not uh, whenever the crawl have uh, time for it, but will be like uh, in, in the upcoming uh, few hours. You can do that. Uh, you can also um, see all the branches and all the releases of this repository. Okay. So here you have a bunch of, you can navigate through the branches. You can choose a different one as you would do in a generic uh, version control system interface. Something else you can do is use this interface, which is save code now, which essentially, instead of just asking our crawlers to archive again something that, is, uh, that has already been archived, you can ask the crawlers to archive a repository you care about. So there is for now support for Git, Mercurial, and Subversion. We are rolling out support for CVS soon, and there is also support uh, not open to the public, but already available to staff for archiving individual tarballs and uh, zip files that people might have on some institutional websites or uh, their own page as well for demand archival of specific piece of code you care about. Uh, so back to the uh, the rest of my presentation. Uh, so this is essentially the experience you can have as a user. And in addition to that, if you are a developer, you might want to integrate with our API. So it's a RESTful API, which is essentially the equivalent of what I've shown you you can do with the, uh, with the browser. So you can use the interface for searching for stuff that we have archived. And then 
for browsing them down. So you can see what are all the visits of a given repository, find the top level snapshot of them, and essentially go down to the revision, to the directory, to the file content, and so on and so forth. You can also retrieve uh, metadata for all the archived objects. For instance, we detect the license of files that um, we are archiving with the Fosology. You can retrieve those metadata. And you can also have all crawling information like when have we last archived the repository you care about and where its branches were pointing at at the time. I'm not going to show you the de I'm not going to show you the detail of the API. They are fully documented on the web. Just click on web API if you're a developer and you will find all the details that you care about. Something else I've mentioned are these kind of uh, intrinsic identifiers of all the stuff that we archive that you can obtain with the permalink button on the web interface. And these are actually becoming pretty popular identifiers in the ecosystem. For instance, if you care about uh, software bill of, of bill of materials of, uh, of software that include uh, free and open source software, there is a standard called SPDX, which is used among industry to share this kind of information. So which open source components are contained in this product I'm buying or putting on the market. Uh, and you can use software heritage identifiers in that kind of document. If you go on Wikipedia, and uh, you can also associate to uh, software projects uh, a property that points to the, uh, their software repository, and you can use software identified identifiers there as well. Uh, it's also a, a YANA registered uh, URI prefix. So essentially, what we are expecting is that in the future, people will be able to just put those URI into their browser or any other um, application that uses uh, YANA URI prefixes and get automatically uh, pointed to the version of that piece of code archived on Software Heritage. So for instance, here in this slide, I have uh, two links. I'm going to share the slide. So here there is a link that if I click on it, it's going to bring me directly to the, uh, implement, the famous implementation of the reverse query root in Quake 3. And it's just a SWH11, et cetera. Uh, intrinsic identifier and the same, this is a piece of code. This link will bring you to a piece of code of the Apollo 11 source code, which of course we have also archived. Uh, you can use those identifiers on your own code. Okay, So you can install uh, the a Python module that compute these identifiers for source code you care about with the pip install SWH model. And you can use it to compute the identifier software you have on your local machine. Okay. Of course, as long as the software is only on your local machine, you will not be able necessarily to find it in the archive itself unless someone else has archived it. But if you discover that software you care about is not archived yet in Software Heritage, you can use the save.softwareheritage.org uh, interface, which I've shown you before, to request archival of the piece of code so that in the future, uh, everyone that care about your software will be able to find it on Software Heritage as well. And the last technical thing I want to show you today is that we also have a software heritage file system, which is a virtual file system built on top of Fuse, a uh, file system in user space that you can find on Linux, and that allows you to mount on your machine a piece of the software heritage archive as if it were locally available software. OK, uh, so it's uh, the software, the file system itself is, of course, implemented as open source software. Here you can you, here you have links to the uh, source code of its own implementation and its documentation. And we also have a paper describing it if you are interested in the software engineering aspect of it. But if not, let me just give you an example here. You can install pip install uh, swh.fuse, which will install the Python model implementing the virtual file system. Then you will mount an empty directory that you just create for this occasion. So you create a directory, you mount it, and you will have in there a bunch of virtual directories from which you can start browsing the archive. For instance, imagine that you know that a file you care about have a specific software heritage identifier like this one, maybe because you have found it on the web, or maybe because some paper or some other website was referencing code using software heritage identifier, maybe Wikipedia, for instance. And then you can simply do cut archive slash identifier. And this will show you the content of this specific file, which is a class, one of the many possible versions of a classic hello world implemented in C. So this is just for a single file. Then, of course, you can do more. Imagine you have this directory identifier here. You can CD into that virtual directory 
you will do ls, you will find that there are 127 files in there. And this piece of code is, in fact, the code of the uh, Apollo 11 guidance computer that you can grab. So for instance, you can grab antenna in a bunch of files, including this file, which I happen to know contains stuff about the, uh, the antenna positioning. And you will find comments from the original Apollo 11 source code as if they were locally available on your machine. So this is without having to do any Git clone, any retrieval of tarball at all. It's all a virtual file system that operates over the network using the uh, Software Heritage REST API. You can do more. You can, for instance, CD into a virtual directory for a commit. So this is a Software Heritage identifier of the rev type for a vision. And you will see in there that you have a bunch of virtual directory containing the development history, such as the previous commits, or metadata. So metadata are in JSON format. So you can use, for instance, uh, the command line tool JQ to, the, to retrieve the author name date and message of this commit you have retrieved here. And you will find that here is the author name. This is a timestamp of when the commit was done. And here you have a commit message. Uh, or you can just do stuff like, this, this is a specific commits of the uh, jQuery project, I believe. So you can search all the JavaScript file contained in this source code version and count all the lines of code in there. And there are 10,000 lines of code in this specific version of the, um, of the jQuery uh, library. Last example, uh, you can uh, now check all the branches that there are in a given project at the time of archival. So you can use SWH web search, which is the equivalent of the web search which I've shown you. Uh, here we are searching for a project called GitanX, which is a great distributed and uh, open source replacement for Dropbox and similar services by Joy Haas. You will find here the, uh, the project. Okay, and so essentially what you can do is that you can CD in the virtual directory corresponding to this uh, project, and you will find that the last version, when this slide, when this slide has been written, there are more recent archival now, but at the time there, there, are, there was only a single visit taken on uh, December 2020, and, can, and you can see where the master branch was pointing at the time uh, that snapshot was taken. Uh, so. Uh, this was it for my uh, general presentation. So let me just uh, tell you something about how you can help, and then I will be happy to answer your questions. So you can help, first of all, as a user, by expanding your archive coverage. If you find something which is not archive, something you care about, some piece of uh, free and open source software you care about that is not archived yet in uh, Software Heritage, just go to save.softwareheritage.org or just click on Save Code Now on uh, on the Archive Web UI, and ask our crawler to uh, archive that piece of code. That is very important and it's a simple step that everyone can do. You can help financially. So we are a nonprofit initiative, as mentioned. We accept both donations from individual and sponsoring for companies or institutions. So if you want to be a champion for a new sponsor, that's very much appreciated. You can help as a coder if you are into development by just joining our community of open source developers. So you have all the classic information like where is the code, where is the chat, where is the mailing list, uh, where are the bugs, and so on and so forth. It's all available on the website on the developer community page. Or you can also you know, take the next step and consider working with us. We have opportunities for both students as internships, both practical and more research-oriented internships. And we also have job openings for both technical and management level profile. Uh, so anything you can do to help with our mission would be much appreciated by us and also by future generations. So thanks a lot for, for listening and I'm available to answer all your questions. Hi. Um, Hi. I was uh, wondering as you gave this presentation, how could uh, such a large uh, corpus of information be classified? So the equivalent of a large library is that there's a taxonomy system that says, for example, there's the standards of the Library of Congress in the US, that there are different subjects like medicine, astronomy, philosophy, and so on. So I was wondering what could the equivalent be for software? 
Right, so uh, essentially this is the question about uh, metadata essentially, and uh, there are several standards about um, software metadata. We are uh, working with a lot of digital librarian and people developing ontologies for software. And there are several ways to do that. The, 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 the way we are attacking this pro problem right now is that we are mining in separately from archival, we have essentially an asynchronous process that periodically is do mining of all the software metadata that are contained in software itself. And essentially we are exhibiting it as an ontology of all the software we have archived. So I, I haven't shown you, but if you go on the search page, you have a, a button which says search in metadata instead of searching in the software URL. And you can search software using that ontology. Essentially, this is the, the first step we are, we are doing right now, allowing users to find software on the base of the metadata declared by software authors. Uh, but of course, there is also the, the matter of how you cross reference what we archive with people that are curating the history of software. And on that front, we're working, for instance, with the Wikidata folks to create links from Wikidata resources about software and the archive, helping essentially with collective curation of all the software we are archiving. Hi, uh, I'm Gianluca Boiano, and I want to ask uh, the main concerns about uh, binary object storage uh, against versus the source code, because I've seen that uh, in introduction, uh, the main topic is source code archiving, archivement. So what are the main concerns about a binary object? And I have another question. I don't know if uh, I can follow it. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Faster. Thank you. Yeah, so about that one very quickly. So we have uh, taken a first decision early on in the project of not trying ourselves to exclude anything from the stuff we have, we have archiving, we are archiving. So essentially we decide that a place is primarily used to distribute source code. If that place also happened to include binary files, we also archive those at the moment. So for instance, on GitHub, you can find many repositories that people are using, let's say, not really properly, in also storing binary files in there. For now, we are also archiving those. It's not, it, it has not been a major problem right now, but that means that in the archive, you will find also incidental binary files, which is not creating a major problem for now at the moment. Okay. So maybe that leads time for your second question. Okay, thank you. The, the other question is um, about the previous, that we've s all we have seen, the, the trial of GitHub, for example, to archive um, on Arctic Code Vault, to archive the history of code and all the con main contributions. So they stored the source code on microfilm uh, made by a Svidi Swedish uh, <laughs> company. So what are the limits to storage and archive source code on, uh, I don't know, a hard disk or digital uh, sure. proven, yeah. What are the main so concerns? We, we are part of the uh, of the archival program uh, of GitHub. We are a we are a partnership. We are in partnership with them. And in fact, what they stored uh, under ICE to simplify it, was only a very limited subset of GitHub. For instance, the only stored project with a given number of stars, the only stored project that were active at the time, and the only stored the most recent version of each project at the time of their archive because that technology is really, 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 really expensive. However, it is important to have also archives that are offline, that are not you know, stored on hard disk, as you say. And the way we are attacking this problem is that periodically, once per year, we want to take essentially offline copies on the, on the entire archive, and store them on technology that we cannot delete and that would resist you know, the hypothetical uh, electromagnetic storm of planetary uh, dimensions. We're doing that for now in collaboration with CINES, which is a large, a large digital archive uh, institution here in France. But any sort of offline archival that can be taken periodically of everything we have, it's really important and it's part of our mission. Mm -hmm.